Bless the Lord, everyone. It's good to be here. And I just want to thank Pastor Ricky and Joyce and his family for inviting me along in the church here in the tabernacle in Bellamina. It's lovely just to, to come to share with you. And that singing was tremendous, wasn't it? Wasn't it? <laughs> Not unless I was turned on, you heard me. I hope you didn't. The only singer in our house was a sewing machine. But anyway, but uh, again, as I say, it's lovely to be here. I have a wee message tonight. It's very simple, but it's very clear, and it's very much to the point. And that's what it's all about tonight, getting to the point. If you've got an illness, a lot of us unfortunately have, but when we go to the doctor, we don't want to hear a lot of rigmarole. We just want them to get to the point and tell us. It's like the wee man went to the doctor, and the doctor says, I've bad news for you. He says, you have only three minutes to live. And he says, doctor, can you do anything for me? He says, I could boil you an egg. <laughs> See if it's going to go like that tonight, I'm on <laughs> It'll happen in a minute. All right. Re Hebrews chapter 9. And we'll read verse 27 and verse 28. I had a few jokes, but I'm a wee bit reluctant now, so I'm after that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Say after this. After this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Let us just pray. Father, we stand in your presence tonight unto this canvas cathedral. We thank you for the songs, Lord, that's been sang. We thank you for the prayer that's been offered. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of reading your word. And we pray now you'll take the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart and make it acceptable, O God, in your sight. At the end of this, Lord, we do pray that someone or many will come to put their personal trust in you. They'll come to know you, whom to know is life everlasting. So we pray you'll move, Holy Spirit, from seat to seat and from heart to heart that you would convict of sin of righteousness and of judgment to come. Have your way, we pray, and we'll be careful as always to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So I want to speak on four certainties in an uncertain age. Four certainties in an uncertain age. The first one, solemn as it may seem, is the certainty of death. Everyone who's been born into this world has been born with that prospect. For the Bible says that everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. For the Scripture tells us as in Adam, all die, but in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. Bible says in 2 Samuel 14, for as water, we must needs die, for as water is poured upon the ground and can't be gathered again, neither does God respect any person. Yet he has defied means whereby his banish be not expelled. For as water is poured upon the ground and can't be gathered again, God doesn't respect persons. But thank God he's the five means whereby his banished be not expelled. Aren't you glad God always has the answer? Aren't you glad that the Lord has a way in the midst of a situation? Left the man was helpless. Left the man was hopeless. But God found a way. I love that hymn, love found a way to redeem my soul. Friend, I want to tell you, death, is an unsolved mystery. It's called the king of terrors and the tower of kings. 
You can't escape it. You have to face it. And unfortunately, people don't want to come to that point. But it's sure. Listen to Ecclesiastes 8. There is no man who has the power over his spirit to retain the spirit. Neither has he power in the day of death. There is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver them who are given to it. Wickedness won't deliver any man or any woman. It'll feel you like Satan himself and leave you destitute and undone before a just and a holy God. Friend, the current death rate, it goes up and down. When I read this, it must have been the case. Three people every second pass into eternity. 180 every minute. 11,000 every hour. 260,000 every day and 95 million every year. By the time I finish this service tonight, there's been literally thousands passed into eternity. I read about old preachers, and Brother Ricky was talking about revival and quickening men and women and preaching righteousness and holiness. I read of old preachers when they preach this. People dropped dead in the congregations. People screamed and fell dead. Dead as dead can be. And they moved them and preached on. Friend, I'll tell you, revival brings a cost. But then so does sin. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Yes, 95 million every year. Job says, man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also like a shadow and continueth not. Friends, I want to tell you, whether your days be many or few, they'll come to an end. They're going to end. And when they end, you're going to have to face God. And when you face God, you'll be judged. And I'll get to that in a minute. And you'll, judged, you'll be judged a righteous judgment because there's no partiality with him, praise his holy name. You know, whether your days is say, or few or many, they'll come to an end. There's an inscription on a tombstone in Cornwall in England, and it reads like this. I expected this, but not so soon. Strange the things people put on their gravestones. Strange. There's one in a cemetery in Indiana, in the U.S. of A. And it reads like this. It's been standing over 100 years. Pause, stranger, as you pass by. As you are and I, so once was I. As I am and I, so you will be. So prepare for death to follow me. And someone looked at it and etched underneath it. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you. Make sure you know which way you're going tonight. As I say, death is no respecter of persons. Young or old, young or old, you know I've buried children and I hate the thought of it. I've buried teenagers. I've buried people who have lived out all their life. I've buried in the years of pastored too many people. And I'll tell you, it's never nice. It's never nice, but it's always hard when it comes to the young. But young or old, wise or foolish, man or woman, famous and obscure, rich or poor, good or bad, keen or commoner, no age exempt, no color excused, the, the dynam dynamic young businessman, the glamorous actress, the great athlete, the brilliant scientist, the television personality, there's one this week, Michael Parkinson, the powerful politician. None of these can resist the moment when death will lay its hand upon them and bring all their achievements to nothing. As I have said, death is no respecter of persons, of time 
or place. It is neither season nor parish. It can strike at any moment of time or day, on land or sea, or in the air. It comes to the hospital bed, the busy road, the comfortable armchair, the sports field, the office. There's not a single spot on the face of the planet where it is not able to strike. The whole world is a hospital, and every person in it is a terminal patient. What we call living can just be as rightly called Dan. Thomas Brooks, the Puritan preacher, wrote over 400 years ago, we carry a bite in our bodies the matter of a thousand deaths, and we may die a thousand ways every day. Listen to Brooks just for a moment, and I'll read what he wrote. As many senses, as many members, nay, as many pores as there are in the body, so many windows there are for death to enter. Death need not spend all its arrows upon us, a worm, a knot, a fly, a hair, the stone of a raisin, the kernel of a grape, the fall of a horse, the stumbling of a foot, the prick of a pen, the purring of a nail, the cutting of a corn, all these have been to others and may be to us a means, the means of our death. Even in this day, this age of organ transplants, microsurgery, intensive care units, wonder drugs. Isn't it wonderful, these wonder drugs? You take them and you wonder what happened to you. But wonder drugs and other medical advancements. Cryolo cryology, is that what they call it? The science of cryology? Cryonics or cryogenics, to get the word right. What is that, Pastor? That's the rich trying to avoid death and cheat death. Years ago, they invented this. They got nitro, uh, nitro, liquid nitro, and they froze the body, and they put the body into this nitro, and they hope when they get an answer in the future, they'll thaw the body out and will be able to live on. They feel they can cheat death. And they were offering, I think it was near a half a million when it first came out, but they were doing a bargain. They were going to freeze the head only for $60,000. There you are. And they'll sew a body onto it or grow a body onto it when they have this all sorted. Well, the years has passed. There's people, I think there's 250 of them in ice. They say Disney was one of the first. So Disney frozen is nothing new. But I want to tell you, that's only a rumor. That's not true. Walt Disney had lung cancer. And 34 days after he was diagnosed, he was cremated. He's not in ice. Far from it. But here, they brought it down now to $50,000. So you can get frozen for $50,000. You want to live in our house, you get frozen for nothing. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> friend, what Brooks wrote remains essentially true. All that the most gifted physician or the most brilliant surgeon can do is postpone the inevitable death it's an appointment, and we all must keep it. We all must keep it. We have an appointment with it. You know, this may be a bit morbid, but I want to tell you, just to get this through to you, even the worst know that they've the face death. In 1992, in San Quentin Prison, there was a man called Robert Alton Horace, he was the first in 25 years to be gassed. Funny, strange man. He murdered two teenage boys the night before they were going to execute him. He had put an order in. He wanted a bargain bucket of chicken, 21 pieces, two large pizzas, a bag of jelly beans, and a packet of camel cigarettes. And he ate them. And they got him into the gas chamber. And they got him out again because he got to stay. That night they put him in the gas chamber three times. 
and eventually six o'clock in the morning they gassed him. And they asked the prison warden, what did he say? What was his last words? This is what he said. Strange man, morbid. He says, you may be a king or a road sweeper, but we all must dance with the grim reaper. Boy, that was his last words. But friend, we all have an appointment in death, and we can't escape it. You're going on about it, yes, to get it through to you, because you never think it's going to happen. It's always somebody else. It's always somebody else. It's like the wee Irishman used to buy the Ulster Saturday night and check the second page to see if his name was in it. Do you remember the death column was the second page? Where are you? Anyway, it's going to come to us. It's only a legend from the streets of Baghdad, but it's worth telling. A wealthy servant sent his, a wealthy merchant sent his servant into the marketplace to buy provisions. And off he went. And when he's in the marketplace, he spied an old woman. And as he went closer over to her, he seen that it was death. And he ran back to his master and he said, Master, lend me your horse that I may flee to Samaria. And their death will not get me. And the master says, Why? He says, Today I seen this woman and she made a threatening gesture. And as I looked closer, it was death. Lend me your horse that I may flee to Samaria. And so the master gave him the horse and off he went. And later on that day, the master went into the marketplace. He saw that the old woman. And he says, why did you scare my servant? And the old woman said, sir, I didn't mean to scare your servant. You see, I was surprised to see him here today when I have an appointment with him tonight in Samaria. See, there's no way to escape it. That's an appointment. And we're all hurrying along to keep it. We all have a date in Samaria and death. But thank God the fear of death can be taken out for those who trust Jesus. Hi, is that, Pastor? Well, the Bible tells me in Hebrews 2 and 14, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise himself took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, the devil, who had the power of death, and deliver them, listen, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He came to face our fear. He came to take the fear out of it. And thank God he can take the sting out of it. Amen. He can take the sting out of it for those who trust him. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So then, when this mortal has put on immortality and this corruption has put on incorruption, then shall the saying be brought to pass, death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be delivered from the sting of it and from the fear of it and from the awful tyranny that it's going to bring. But friend, if you trust in yourself, I'll tell you, this an awful thing. I've sat with men and told them, you're not going to see the night out. I can say this, and I'm not saying anything that's going to hurt anybody. I remember running up the Antrim, the big man, he gets saved in one of my meetings. Like myself, he was on the oxygen. He used to come, and I called them the Goosebusters. Now, I'm a Goosebuster. I carry it about. I'm doing all right up here. But he had a tumor growing also. And I remember going up to the hospital, and his family's there. And the doctor just says, do you want to resuscitate it? You're not getting through the night. And that's the way it was said. 
And the man drained. He drained. And I'll tell you, this man was one of the top boys in the paramilitaries. He drained. And I says, look, hang on a minute. I said, to the doctor, hang on. Let me talk to this family. And I says to them, and it says, look, just, if he's going to go, let him go. And I went over to him, and it says, I'll let tell you his name. Just said, brother, you're not getting through the night. And they're saying, just to let you go. But you know, Christ is going to get you through the night. He's going to take your hand, and he's going to help you through. And you're going to get through this night into his presence. Boy, the relief. The fear turned to relief because you see somebody stirring and they're talking about you and talking about you except that's a matter of fact. It wasn't a matter of fact to him. The Bible calls it a fearful looking on. And that's what it is to the unsaved. You'll go out terrified. You'll go out screaming unless you know him and the peace of God in your heart and life. Death is an awful thing. But friend, it's not so much important how you, how you die. It's how you live. It's how you live that matters. How you live. You see, you can't live long and wrong and die right. Pastor, I sat under, used to always say that. You can't live long and wrong and die right. The Bible says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Yea, henceforth, says the Spirit, they do rest from their labors, and their works do fall on them. Remember years ago, a friend of mine saying, in the Shankle Road one day, a girl was knocked down, a teenage girl. She lay on the road, Dan. And she was heard to say to her mother, who was leaning over her, you, you taught me how to drink. You taught me how to party. You taught me everything that the world, the world offers. But I'm Dan, and you haven't taught me how to die. See, fear gripped her. Fear gripped her. Friend, it's not so much as how you live or how you die. It's how you live. And I'll tell you, if you're living for Christ, then you'll die right. You'll die right. Death doesn't work any fundamental change in a man or woman's life. See all this, it's better for them now. We've all heard the ministers and the priests, and they have to do this, they feel. But I always worried because you've given account to God. But everybody's going to heaven. Do you ever listen to them? Listen to them at the graveside. Oh, they were great, and they're with the Lord now. Well, I'll tell you, you're with the Lord if you made your peace with God. And you've got your heart right, and you're with the Lord. Remember a woman, a widow woman sitting with her son. And the minister's going on and on about her, the deceased husband and how wonderful he was. Great man and this, that, and the other. And she said to her son, oh, way up and look into that coffin and see about your dad in there. Huh? Huh? People aren't stupid. People aren't stupid. What did I tell you? I'll tell you what the Word of God says. Revelations 22, in case you think this is me, in case you think this is Pastor Ricky, this is what the Word of God says. Revelations 22, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You see, what you are before death is what you'll be in it. It's what you'll be after it. So don't think for a minute. Don't think for a minute. Oh, I wasn't a bad person. I wasn't like Ricky Bell. I wasn't like Carrie Fittis. They needed salvation. I was always good. Friend, the Bible says there's none good. Not one. Not one. Finish this wee point in this. Simon Cameron wrote that wonderful hymn. Then soon will come those autumn years when life has passed and death appears. Too late to change the path we've trod. 
when standing face to face with God. I'm going to tell you this, and I hope you don't mind for a few minutes. I was Brian, a wee girl at 24, lovely kid. She took a brain tumor right here. They couldn't operate. I remember sitting when I was preaching, taking wee sermon notes, with a big plaster over it. About five days later, she took a turn. And away she went. I was burying her. And I quoted that. I felt impulse upon me. The quote that I just read out there. Then soon will come those autumn years. When life is past and death appears. And I said to myself, what are you quoting that for? But I did. And at the end, this Indian lad came over to me with a Scottish accent, for Simon Cameron was Scottish. He says, you just quoted my father there at the grave. I says, oh, right, son, you, 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 is it up to check? Yes. And while I'm talking to him, an Englishman came over. He says, you quoted Simon Cameron there. I says, I oh, says, Simon Cameron dedicated that wee girl he just buried. And in a tent, when she was 13 years of age, a tent, she gave her heart to the Lord when Simon Cameron was preaching. How would I have known that? You see, Pastor Ricky's talking about the Spirit. I'll tell you, the Spirit knows things we don't. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? But I'll tell you one thing. I never was at a more victorious, glorious funeral in all my life. That big girl's father walked in front of that coffin from the church and sang hymns and praised God right to the cemetery. <laughs> Her father. And he's out preaching the night. Has never missed a turn. Because he has his assurance. Absent from the body. To be present with the Lord. Go on to be with Christ. Which is far better. This isn't something we imagine. This is real. This is real. So hurrying on. Hurrying on. The second certainty is judgment will be quick. And it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this is judgment. That's not the worst thing that can happen to us. According to the Holy Scriptures, all of us will have to face the judgment. Friend, how will God judge you? How will God judge you on that day? The great lawmaker will want to know if you've broken his law. The great lawmaker will ask you, have you broken his law? And he knows everything. Listen to 1 John 3. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. Whosoever sins has broken the law for sin is a transgression of the law. And First John says, and first yet if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, all have sinned. We've heard that this morning. All have sinned and come short. But I love this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, the evidence will be produced. Every sin and wrong deed brought to light. I haven't the time. Ricky said, take all the time, but I don't like taking too much. But I'll tell you, there will be an account. And there will be everything is arranged before this throne. And everything will be read out. And the books will be open, and then there'll be another book. And everything that's been done will be there. And friend, you can stand there. And like Eamon Andrews, this is your life. It will be your life. It'll be your life bare before him. And there'll be no excuses. There'll be no favoritism. There'll be no one getting oh, special attention, special prayers, a lot of nonsense. A lot of nonsense. These things have all been concocted by man to get that. I'll tell you, when this happens, man has no say in the matter. See, when this happens, 
people haven't even a notion of opening their mouths because they'll be before, before him. And I'll tell you, and I'm going to jump here. It's called a great white throne. And I'll tell you why it's great. It's great because of the enormity of the sentences that's going to issue from it. And the whiteness comes from his purity, his holiness, his justice. Because when he judges, he judges righteous judgment. And there's nobody can say anything against him because the Bible makes it clear, surely the judge of all the earth will do what's right. And what's wrong in this world? You have too many people trying to play God. You have too, too many people trying to legislate and trying to sort everything out and play God. Someday every tongue will be stopped and everybody will be guilty before him. The sooner the better. I said to my son, driving down here, this world's coming to an end. And I'll tell you why. Because the unrighteous is bringing it to an end. Have you ever seen sin in the way it is now? Have you ever seen debauchery? Have you ever seen, and I mean this immorality, the way you openly see it now? And the Lord says, all these things will happen. And when you see them happening, friend, he's at the door. He's at the door. He's nearer than you think. I want to say this. It's a terrible day. It's a dreadful day. But God says, and I love this in his word, why should you die? Why should you die? Why should you be judged when I've offered you forgiveness? I've offered you peace. I've offered you a place with me. He's no pleasure, he says, in the death of the wicked. And though he's speaking to the house of Israel, could I say to you, why should you die? Why should you die in the light of this next certainty? As it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Now listen, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him, he shall appear. Why should you die when God has offered his son to be your substitute and your sacrifice? Why? Why? The certainty of a sin bearer. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Could I say this, friend? Could I say this? Christ offered himself once. Once on the cross for your sins. Listen to Hebrews 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He who bore our sins on his body on the tree. He who was laid on him the iniquity of us all. He who the Father bruised for you and for me. Friends, the God of justice is also the God of all grace and the Father of mercy. He in his love has made a way for guilty sinners to escape the wrath of his judgment. Look, if I was you, and I was listening to what I have heard tonight, I would be looking for a way out. Not out of the tent, out of this predicament called judgment. Called judgment. Because we are all going to stand before God. And the books will be open, as I said. And there's a book of remembrance, which everything is written into it. And remember, God knows everything. Every single thing. But the Bible says, if you believe in the Son, you're passed from judgment on the life. Friend, there's the answer. Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. The girl said it this morning at the Sunday school. And your house. Boy, we simple things are the wee things that really matter. 
Do you hear his voice through his word? Do you hear him saying to you tonight, why should you die? Why should you be judged? Why should you go through all of this when there's mercy? He in his love has made a way for guilty sinners to escape his wrath. Righteousness demanded a victim and mercy provided one. Righteousness, God is righteous and he had to judge sin and he done it in the person of his son. He dealt with Jesus because of your sin and mine. And if you make light of sin, as the Bible says, fools mock at it, then you don't really understand. And I say this, the devil has blinded your mind that you can't fully comprehend what this is all about. Look, you don't have to be a scholar. Jesus died in your room and in your stead. Jesus took your place. And I'll tell you, if you carry on in your sin, and you carry on living the way you're living, you'll die, you'll be judged, and you'll be condemned to the lake of fire. And there's no second chance, and there's no excuse. Love found a way. Mercy provided a sacrifice. Listen to Job. Deliver him from going down to the pit. I found a ransom. You know, Brother Ricky was talking about the Lord, saying, imagine him saving the likes of us. Well, can you imagine what it must have been like in heaven? Because it speaks of the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Can you imagine a Savior promised and a Savior willing to come forth for you and for me? They've seen him in his manliness and his humanity. And I'll tell you, I often wonder what it must have been like just to walk with him, just to listen to him, just to watch him. You know, they were so captivated by him. They even watched how he died. They even watched how he died. I'll tell you, I want to know him. And I don't want to know him to prove I'm a great Christian. I want to know him because he took my place. And he died in my room instead. Look, if I give you an organ and you were in this meeting tonight living, you would want to shake my hand. You'd want to congratulate me. Well, I'm going to tell you, he gave his life for me. What do you want to do with him? What are you going to do with him? Friend, the fact is this. Jesus offered himself once on the cross to bear your sins. And we as sinners couldn't save ourselves. Therefore, Christ died for the ungodly. Our brother said it this morning. He quoted this verse, for we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And one translation puts it like this. While we were powerless, while we were powerless to help ourselves, that Christ died for sinful men. You see, he didn't expect you to do anything. He knew you were incapable of doing anything. He came when you could do nothing. And he died for you as you in your place. All he wants you to do tonight is acknowledge that. Acknowledge that. And show your appreciation for that in giving him your life and letting him have his rightful place in your heart. And friend, if you come to him, he will not turn you away. He welcomes all who ask for mercy. Why? Because he delights in mercy will not turn away any who come to him in the name of his only son. Your only, for, only qualification tonight for mercy is to know your need. Is to know your need. The poem goes like this. Let not fondness make you linger or of fitness. Let not conscience make you linger or of fitness fondly dream. 
The only fitness he requireth is to know your need of him. Do you know your need of him tonight? Do you know him? Because he's coming back. And I'll just quickly finish with this. He shall appear the second time, it says, without sin. That means he'll appear apart from sin. You see, he dealt with sin in his body than when he came the first time. But he's coming back the second time. And everything points to it. Everything points to it. There's 370 something references in the New Testament. 108, 1870 something in the Old. Of the 27 books, 25 speak of it. Every 25th verse mentions the second coming in some form or fashion. Friend, he's coming again. But if he were to come tonight, are you ready? Are you ready? Because see, when he comes, we're told in 2 Thessalonians, he's going to come in flaming fire and vengeance. And he's going to punish the unjust. He's not coming to be spot upon or mocked or ridiculed. He's not going to be come, come to listen to the blasphemies that men and women do openly every day. He's going to come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says in Revelation 6, the kings and the princes of this world are going to cry and call for the rocks to hide them. I'm going to tell you what, what could be more awful than a mountain falling on you. And yet that would be desired more than to have to face Christ. That would be desired more and have to face Christ. You know, I was reading this the other day. Whether shall I go from thy presence? Whether shall I flee from thy spirit? If I am in my bed in hell, even there you would find me. If I chose a darkness to cover me, it would be light. Night would become light. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide when he comes. He's going to come as your judge if he doesn't come as your savior. Friend, what will he be to you tonight? Your coming king or your coming judge. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That simply means he's going to come to take us from the very presence of sin. Boy, what a day. What a day. When we're not going to be subject to the twist and bentness of this world. And I mean it. This world is vile, filthy. And he's coming to purge it. He's coming to deal with it. And it will be burned up. Friend, tonight, what will you be? And where will you stand? in the light of his appearing. Will you welcome him? Will you welcome him? Or will you hide from him? Which is futile. Because you've heard me saying, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro upon the earth. Friend, he knows everything. He sees everything. And he knows your heart tonight. He knows your thought afar off. He knows everything about you. And yet he's willing to save you if you would let him. So don't try and figure it all out. Just acknowledge this. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And if you acknowledge tonight that you're a sinner, because all have sinned, all have sinned, and come short, then I want to tell you, according to God's word, You've got a Savior. And He's your Savior, Savior if you let Him be. But you have to invite Him in. And the proof that He's come in will be underscored by the change in your life. Your life will be changed for any man or woman in Christ as a new creature. Old things will have passed away. And behold, all things will become new. Do you want a new life? Do you want a new start? Then you can start it with Jesus. 
Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Just looking over the congregation. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. We're not going to ask you to come to the front. We're not here to make a spectacle of any. But we want to give you an opportunity tonight. This is why this tent is here. And this is why the gospel is preached. That you could have forgiveness of sins and peace with God. I'm going to ask you to do something. It won't save you, but it will be an indication that you're willing to ask Christ into your heart. Your faith will save you. And your belief, and your acknowledgement that you're a sinner, and Christ died for sinners. So right now, as every head's bowed, and every eye's closed, in the quietness of your own seat, if you're willing to accept Christ as your own and personal Savior, would you do something? Would you let me pray for you? And if you're willing to let me pray for you and accept Christ into your heart, then do something to help me. Slip up your hand so I can see it. Put it up, take it down again, we'll see it, and we'll pray for you. Is there someone here tonight, quickly, by the reason of that hand would be indicating that they want prayer for salvation, they want forgiveness of sins and peace with God. Quickly, looking over this congregation, is there someone? God bless you. God bless you. Is there another? Is there another? I see that hand. You can take it down. Is there anyone else tonight in this congregation? No one's looking. Only myself. Is there someone along with that person who will accept Jesus as their own and personal Savior? Who will say, Pastor, Terry, I don't want to fall into judgment. I don't want to face the wrath of God. I want to be forgiven and set free. I'm a sinner, but you told me I can be saved because Jesus died for sinners, yes, and Jesus died for you. For the last time, is there someone, someone else, who will come to know Jesus as their own and personal Savior? If there is, put that hand up now. Put it up, we'll see it, and we'll pray for you. Friend, we can't go on. We can't go on. It's your decision. Thank God for one. But is there anyone else tonight? A backslider, perhaps. You need to come back. And you need to come back publicly. If there is, let us pray for you. Let us pray for you. Well, then, will you just pray this prayer with me to help that lady? And just you say this prayer with me, love. It's not this prayer, but it's your faith. You open your heart as we pray this. You ready, church? Father, I come to thee. Come on. Father, I come to thee. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, take me now, a pure sinner. Wash me in your precious blood. Cleanse me from all my sin. Give me the strength to live for you and the courage to confess you. Come into my heart right now and save me. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Maybe you know the pastor, but if you don't, he's a lovely man, isn't he? Look at him. Just make yourself known to him, and he'll help you. All right. If you need to talk to us, we'll stand at the door for a wee bit. God bless you. Pastor Ricky.